There we go. We are recording. Yay. Yay. What's the weather like in Boston right now? Uh, it's like mid-80s. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's not humid there, right? Not today. It can be on some days. It can get pretty muggy in the summer, but um, today it's really nice. So. Awesome. But you are, you live in Texas though, right? Yes. You're visiting Boston and you live in Texas. Yes. Okay. And are you yeah. from Texas originally? Uh-huh. I grew up in the Dallas area, but I live in Austin now. Awesome. That's yeah. so fun. Um, so do you travel speaking a lot? Do you do, because you're there speaking right now. Yep. Do you travel and speak a lot? I do. I do. Uh, I'm trying to do more of it because I really enjoy it. So yeah. I'm trying to, um, you know, connect with the polka dot groups where I'm going different places in the, um, all over the country. So that's a good network. And then I have yeah. friends um, who, you know, will sort of collaborate, put together different kind of women's retreat events, um, do those. Yeah. Well, that's, that's how we met. We met yeah. at the Warrior Unchained live event. We were both speakers at that. So that was super fun. You came from Texas to Wisconsin to come talk there. So that was super fun. It was so fun. It was like, I don't know. I'd never been before. So that's part of what I love about it is I go places that I would not ordinarily go and you meet yeah. people who you would not ordinarily meet. And so, you know, sometimes you come in as the speaker and you're supposed to be like the teacher, but the reality is I get so much more from it um, that I love it for my own personal growth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the vlog too, like that's, I, I honestly, just when I started it, I didn't think about what I would get out of it at all. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, I take nuggets from every single master guest that comes on here and talks about their experiences. I'm like, wow, like I took something away from everyone. And I didn't, I didn't expect that. Cause like you said, yeah. you come into it thinking one thing and then you're like, oh, you're open and right. Yeah. Well, and that's when you know you're doing the right thing too. Yeah, that's true. I like it. It's super fun. Yeah. Well, I want to just uh, formally introduce you to the viewers here. Um, this is Karen Shopoff Roof. She is a women's wellness warrior with more than a decade of experience guiding professional women as they build a realistic, healthy lifestyle. As a certified personal trainer, women's wellness coach, and health coach, she inspires women to be their best self. She started her business, Balanced Professional Fitness Training, in 2008 and has grown it into a popular blog, Well Balanced Women, and a suite of health and wellness e-courses to educate and empower body-wise women. Coach Karen believes that when, when realistic approaches have, are taken, anyone can create a life with wellness and health at the center. Her busy life as an entrepreneur, wife, and mom of three shows that you can have balance without having it all together. Karen, thank you again for joining us on the vlog today. I'm so excited for you to talk more about your story and um, have the viewers just get to know you more and your experience. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to be here. I had so much fun with you at the Warrior Untamed event and you know, getting to know a little bit more about um, your live fearlessly and your passion and just love meeting other women who are happy, willing, grateful, and able to be their own best self. Yes. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. I know a lot of the things that we talk about are very similar and just a um, little bit different approaches, which is great because I think you were the one that had a, a part in your talk that was very much about how we all kind of talk about the same things and we all just have our own approaches and experiences that tie into them um, for coaching and trainings and stuff like that. So super fun when we get to see those things come together. Um, sure. So let's just, let's just get more relatable with the viewers and go ahead and tell us something interesting about your life or you that we wouldn't know otherwise. Mm, I always love this question because I just don't know which way to go. My life is like a smorgasbord <laughs> of weird happenings. That's awesome. Um, so I have a 10 and a half pound house rabbit as a pet. So his name is Fuzzy. He's litter box trained. 
Um, he has a little, uh, not little, like a Great Dane sized dog crate that my husband turned into a bunny condo in the corner oh of our family room, but he's actually a free range bunny. And so he just hops around the house and he kind of has a personality of a cat. When he wants attention, he hops up on the couch and schnuzzles with you. And then when he's done, he hops off and goes and sits in his cage by himself. But, um, my Instagram stories. He is a constant companion on my Instagram stories because I refer to Fuzzy as my coworker. <laughs> when you work at home, it's nice to have another little being there with you sometimes, and he's a very loyal companion. That's true. Oh, how fun. I'm going to have to follow closely on your stories now to see Fuzzy. <laughs> yes. You can't miss him. He's big. He's big. You said 10 pounds? Yeah, he's like 10 and a half pounds. Yeah. Wow. It's a lot of bunny. That's a lot of bunny. I love it. What color is he? He's white with, oh. uh, in the winter time, his ears are black, but right now in the summer, they're very, very, very light gray. Oh. Um, and he has a black nose and then his paws change colors like his ears. Um, and then he, he has red eyes. So some people kind of like at first they're like, it's all freaky. Um, <laughs> he's like an albino. His eyes just don't have any pigment. So yeah. you're seeing the light reflected back through them, huh. but I don't even notice it anymore. He's just adorable. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you had him? About two years. Wow. My middle kid, who's uh, 13 now, had been wanting a rabbit like since second grade. Like every single book report was some book that had rabbits as characters. Like every science project was about rabbits. It was like, you know, the history of raising rabbits in America, like rabbits, rabbits, rabbits. He was obsessed. It's a hint. Um, yeah, and so we finally, finally, after like five years, broke down. And um, the coolest thing, though, that I love for people to know is that we actually adopted him from our animal shelter, just our regular city yeah. animal shelter. That's and awesome. he, he came to us already litter box trained and docile. And I mean, we can never have another pet because he is the greatest pet ever. That's awesome. It, are rabbits, like indoor rabbits, are they loud? Do they make a lot nope. of noise? No. No. So. Honestly, that's what I love about him. Right? <laughs> so There's no barking. Yeah. 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 The main thing is if he, um, he eats a lot of hay, right, to help his digestion. Uh, and if you don't give him enough hay at night, he will like pick up his litter box with his teeth and drop it and pick it up and drop it and pick it up and drop it. And <laughs> And that's the, hey, you guys forgot to give me hay before you went to bed signal. Um, but other than that, super quiet. So he's good at communication too. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They I mean, they're smarter than you think they are. Yeah. But that's awesome. Well, thank you. That was very interesting. <laughs> I love it. I have a couple friends that love rabbits and have them as pets too. So that's super fun. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's dive in about fear because we're not fearful of the rabbits. So yeah. um, let's talk about fear and tell us about a significant time in your life when fear held you back from living your life fully. Oh, so um, I have a, a couple of examples. One, probably the most recent one would be uh, in 2016, I went to South Africa to run a 55 mile race with my dad. So this, this race had been a dream of his for decades. My dad was a, was a very, very good runner in his prime. He was an American record holder at the 50 mile distance, um, sub 230 marathon runner, very, very good runner. And this race in South Africa called Comrades uh, was always on his bucket list. And he desperately wanted to go because that's where all the great runners went. Well, in the 80s, Americans couldn't travel to South Africa because it was still under apartheid. And if you were to run in a South African race, then you wouldn't be able to compete. You, you're basically like banned for life. Um, okay. So then by the time apartheid fell, he had two kids in college and he couldn't afford to go to Africa and, you know, life, right? Life gets in the way. So in 2015, um, he calls and um, uh, running is about the only thing my dad and I have in common. That's what I need. I need to say that because it's very important. <laughs> we have very, very different political views. Uh, yeah. So the running is our thing. Okay. And 2015, he calls me and he says, I, I, I'm going to do it. He said, I'm going to go to South Africa next year and I'm going to run comrades. Um, I'm going to turn 70. 
it's not going to get easier. You know, I got to go do this. And I was like, that's cool. I'm glad, you know, I've been hearing about this race for my entire life. You should totally do this. So then like a week later, I'm on the phone with him and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to go run with you. Like totally. Why? That would be awesome. Let's go do it. Um, and only minor mistake here was that I forgot to tell my husband <laughs> that I wanted to do this before I told my dad. So don't, don't follow that lead there. Um, and so anyway, months of training, right? This is, it's pretty much like a year long training program Yeah. because you have to run a standard marathon, 26.2 miles in order to qualify to run this 55 mile, a little bit more than that, 90 kilometers race in South Africa. Wow. And what you have to know about this race is that it's not just long, it is run through a place, the worst named geographical area ever, the valley of a thousand hills. Okay, and you run at least a thousand of these hills in this 55 mile race. It is, it's crazy. It's, I took a tour of the course two days before the race on a bus and the bus was groaning trying to get up this hill. And I'm thinking, what, like, this is crazy. What have I gotten? What am I doing? And so here I am from the moment of the bus ride until two days later of the race, I was absolutely consumed by fear. Like I couldn't eat. I was throwing up nonstop. I was completely beating myself up with, I can't believe that you've spent so much money to come over here and all of those hours of training that you've taken away from your family and you're here for two weeks and you left the kids at home and there's no way you can do this and it's going to be awful. And why? Like, who are you to do this? That was all I could tell myself. And it was so arresting because I have never in my life before been truly gripped by panic or fear or anxiety before. I've always been a kind of person who's like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do it. And so then I have like the whole side conversation in my head of like, am I going crazy? Why can't I just talk myself out of this? I've been doing my yoga breathing. I've been doing legs up the wall for 20 minutes. Why am I still throwing up? Oh my gosh, maybe I'm actually like really crazy. No, you're fine. You know, and it's like back and forth and back and forth. It was yeah awful. So I finally, I run the race. I finished the race, but I had gotten about uh, almost three hours into the race, which is a long time to run. You know, it, it's, it's hot in Africa, even in the early winter, right? It's like, you know, 75 degrees at six in the morning kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm a health coach, so I talk about gross stuff all the time. So anyway, I had stopped to pee at this porta potty, and it was kind of like an airplane toilet where there was like you know a floor in in the toilet bowl. Yeah. And I, I pee, and it's like brown. It's like syrup, like Ooh. brown or like coffee colored. And I'm thinking, oh my god because I was so crazed out of my head and I did not drink anything, I did not eat anything for like two days and now I've run for three hours, like I'm gonna find myself in a South African hospital with renal failure. Like, this is a problem. Yeah. So that was like a huge, like get a, get a grip kind of a moment. Um, Cause I was like, I, I, no, I'm real clear. I don't wanna do that. Um, You're making me thirsty just hearing yeah, about it. Right? <laughs> Um, so I like was literally, I was pounding water. I was pounding. Uh, it's crazy. Like literally there are people on the side of the road who have salt canisters and you like, they put salt in your hand and you like lick the salt off your hand and then drink all this water. Right. Cause you're trying to keep your electrolytes balanced. Oh my God. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the most gripping, like I not only, yes, could have failed it at finishing the race and wasted the, you know, time and money and energy I'd put into training there, but I could have really done serious bodily damage to myself. So yeah, all Dude, from, all from did fear. Did your dad make the race too? 
my dad wound up having to drop out at about um, 44 miles. He, he had sustained a hamstring injury um, on his very last training run before we left to go to South Africa. He literally like tripped off a curb. Um, oh, he didn't even make it to the- No, he the... did. He, he went and we got to run together for about the first three hours of the race. Okay. It, okay. Was me, it was me telling him, oh my God, I just peed and it was like coffee. <laughs> and he was like, stop. There's a lady over there with salt. He's like, I'm not, I'm not getting out of the hospital here. I'm like, yeah, get a hold of yourself. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was really interesting because that was a um, kind of a role reversal situation for me too, where my dad. Uh, so I left him shortly after that because he wasn't, he already wasn't feeling well, and he's like, no, you've put in so much time, so much training, you've got to go and finish. Um, that he was there at the finish line and, um, oh, you know, waiting for me as I finished. And, um, that was the first time where I felt like I could actually identify with him as a parent, because I know that like, if my kid had done the same thing and like carried on my dream, like that is really almost as good as doing it yourself. Yeah. That's so, really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so during the time that you were like checking out the, the course and, and going through all this stuff in your head, like when the fear was holding you back, where were you mentally during that time? And how did you feel about yourself? Oh, I was totally in that place of like huge imposter syndrome of who are you for even trying this? Why, like, why did you ever think this was a good idea? Like, how did you even think that you would be able to do this? Like complete and total negative self-talk when that's not my normal, like I'm normally a very to my detriment self-confident person. Um, and like I said before, that's what was really arresting about the whole thing is it felt like an out-of-body experience because I, it was like somebody had taken over my brain. Yeah. And I yeah. couldn't step out of it. Right. Right. And well, instantly I'm like, okay, your dad was there too. I'm, I'm assuming he went and saw it all too. Like did you guys talk about like how you, like the, the fact that you were like, dad, or, did you say anything to him? Like, are we going to be able to do this? Like, can you do this? And cause you said he was 70. Yeah. Like yeah. I can't imagine what he's thinking. If you're thinking that, like what, no. he, did you guys talk about your fear in it at all when you were there? Yeah. yeah. And he was um, uh, really super positive about it because the real blessing of this whole experience was that we spent months training together. Uh, yeah, my dad yeah. lives in Dallas. I live in Austin, uh, but he would come to Austin quite frequently. It's much, much hillier in Austin than it is in Dallas. And so he needed to train on hills. Yeah, uh, good thing he did. Right. So we'd done all these training runs together and he just kept saying that he was like, okay, you know, that hill we just went up, that's just like doing the Mount Vanille Hill three times in a row. Like you can do that. You can do it. We did hill repeats. Like, awesome. you know, so there was a lot of, of positive, um, reinforcement, but yeah, it was, a, it was a real lesson that when, when you're down there, it's hard to get out. Yeah. Well, so then the next question is about relationships. So obviously that strengthened the relationship that you had with your dad going through this whole experience and, and the fact that he was like the positive one, like you were talking about the role reverse thing, like you're used to you being that person yeah. for everyone else. And then someone else was stepped in and doing it for you. Like, is there anything else you want to touch on about, you know, the relationship building or um, like, did anything change with, your family with you being gone and doing the trainings or anything like that? Is there anything else with relationships that shifted or? Well, really only that I was so incredibly affected by the whole experience of this race that I came home and I told my husband, um, I'm doing that again next year and we're all going. Okay. And he was like, okay, crazy lady, you go water the money tree to get five of us to Africa. And I was <laughs> like, I was like, no, you don't understand. I was like, we're going. I need the kids to go and to see this event. I need the kids to go and see me as a minority. Only about 4% of the runners are white women. Wow. 4%. Um, I need them to go and see 
uh, what it's like for me to do something that I love, that I devote myself to. I mean, how many freaking soccer games have I sat through? Let's be honest here, people. Band <laughs> concerts, all of it. You know, that I felt like the whole thing was so empowering for me that I needed them to be reminded that I'm somebody outside of them. That's an amazing, like, thing to want to pull in. Did, yeah. did you make that happen? We did. We did. Yeah. And, and we went back the next year and um, my husband and kids hooked up with this um, a, a bus driver to take them to different points on the course. And um, many of the, the towns that this runs through, I mean, this is not affluent people. This, sure. this is very, very rural, very poor. Um, it, it's interesting though, because this event is like the Super Bowl is in the United States where literally people come out and they like line the streets. Um, it's broadcast 12 straight hours on the national TV channel. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, so I had bought all these little like blow up balls, kind of like Pilates balls sort of things that you know, have a little, little straw and plug okay. and um, given them to my husband. And I said, well, wherever you guys stop on the course, you know, you're gonna have to wait for me for a while. Um, so blow up a ball, let the kids play with it, but then leave it with some kids who are there because it doesn't matter where you travel. If you travel with kids and you have a ball, then suddenly you have kids come out of the woodwork to come and play. So I just thought that this would be a really easy way for them to connect in a really authentic way with local people, but then also do something nice. So. That's, that's awesome. That's super fun. I love that you had the crazy thought and you made it come true. <laughs> It was crazy. It was crazy. But I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very practical person. Um, I sort of sat down and I was like, this is how much it's going to cost. And so this is what I'm going to need to do with my work in order to make the extra income in order to make it happen. All right. Yeah. Let's go. Well, that's the thing. Like everything starts with a thought and then moving forward, like making the plan reverse engineering, figure out exactly what you need to do, and then take the action that you need to yeah. do to make it happen. Yeah. And it's interesting. And I, I freely admit, because I'm, I'm very good at the making the plan, at the reverse engineering, at the figure it out. And I'm not always really good at the working the plan part. Um, and that I think, you know, that's where fear gets inserted you know, on a daily basis. It's like, okay, well, why am I not doing this? What am I afraid of? And, you know, most often it's, I'm afraid that it'll actually work. And then what will happen? Then how will things change? Then how will I deal with it? You know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that's an ongoing struggle. Yeah, exactly. And it, I always like to remind people that like, like live fearlessly isn't about having no fear. It's about having those daily fears and finding ways to work through them and, and, you know, make them much smaller fears by actually taking action on them. Yeah. Well, and it starts, I think, with recognizing that it's happening, you know, which I'm now at that level. So now I'm, you know, going to keep pushing. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the next question that I have is um, what compelled you to jump ship from having those fears? But I think honestly, it's your dad, right? Like he was, yeah. he was the one there to be like, no, we've, we've trained for this. We know this kind of stuff. It's not as scary as we think it is. It just, yeah. Scary. Well, and also, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have a lot of options to be honest. Right. I mean, I was there, I was gonna, I was gonna do it and I was gonna get as far as I could get. And, um, you know, I tell people all the time when, you know, I say I'm a runner and they're like, oh God, it's so hard. I'm like, it's one step at a time. It is literally one step at a time. And when you can break that down in your head, you know, then that helps to release some of the fear as well. Well, and two, people think running's hard, but that's because they don't train for it. They don't do the breathing. They don't practice the steps. And like anything, we don't know how to do things properly until we practice it and and yeah. work on the thing that we 
really enjoy and running is your thing. So of course you practice it, you get it into your routine and you get down like how to, to do it for your best self and, and how yeah. you can run 55 miles or whatever it was like, that's yeah. enough. So how well, many, and like, did you finish it all the way? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Both, both years. So I'm good yeah. now for a little while. Um, but I was going to say, you know, uh, from, from my talk at Warrior and Chain that I'm really big on time and like, how do you spend your time and do you spend your time intentionally or do like things just happen like coming at you? And, um, I think that's the other thing about fear is that, you know, people get worried that either it's going to take a long time or that they don't have the time to devote to it or, or whatever. And I just always remind myself that like the time is going to pass anyway right? Like today is yep. going to happen and then tomorrow is going to happen. And then the day after that's going to happen. And then it goes on and on and on. And that doesn't change whether or not I take action. And so yeah. why wouldn't I just take action? Yeah. Fear. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That is literally it. And that's true. And, um, what, so what advice would you give the viewers for overcoming fear in general? I mean, you're already kind of talking about like, Go on a little yeah. deeper about like any advice that you would give for overcoming the fear and taking the action. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to, to do with really, you know, getting quiet and getting honest with yourself about what is the fear about? You know, like I said, for me, so many times it's about the fear of being successful, which is crazy. But, right. but it's not uncommon. You know, I, I work in my health coaching practice with a lot of women who, um, you know, come to me, they say, oh, I, you know, I've tried to lose weight. I can't lose weight and da, 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 da. And so I always sort of back up and I'm like, okay, but what do you want to lose weight for? And once they get really clear on what their why is, what their motivation for doing something is, that helps to release the fear. And it also helps to understand that any type of action taking process, it's a process, it's a transformation, and you can't get to the end of it without letting go of the beginning of it. And that a lot of times that's the scary part is it's like, well, if I let go of what I got here, then I don't got anything right now until I get all the way over there. Um, when I think, you know, it's always much more subtle and discreet than that of like, you know, okay, but you're still who you are right now. And you're still, you know, wherever you are in the process, you can still show up fully in that. And, you know, yeah, it might not be who you were and it might not be who you're going to be, but isn't it all a continuous process? I mean, who's ever done? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I remember back to um, my college graduation weekend and um, one of my roommates was majoring in accounting and, you know, landed a great job with one of the big six accounting firms. And, you know, here I was like as an art history major and I was like just hoping to find a job. Right. And here she's like making bank. Right. And. This is, remember, like this is like hours before graduation. So it has not even actually graduated yet. And she says. God, I just can't imagine that I have to wake up for the next 40 years and every day go be an accountant. And I was like, ooh, oh, like, yeah, I can't imagine that either, but that's why I wasn't an accountant, you know? <laughs> um, but I think that that happens to a lot of people as they get on this path because they think this is where I'm supposed to go. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is something I've heard of before, so I may as well walk in that direction. But they don't ever stop and ask the questions of like, why am I doing this? What am I actually interested in? Like, what gifts do I have to share with other people? Because all of those kinds of the things are things that don't come with the fear baggage of waking up every day for the next 40 years doing something you hate. Right. Okay. Hey, but yeah. she's halfway through now. She's more than halfway through her 40 years. So, you know, bully to her. <laughs> We've lost touch. We weren't super compatible. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I mean that's so true. We have to we have to really think about our own thoughts and what we want. And and if we're not going to be happy, then what's the point? Like we're not here to just pay our bills and, and die. Like we're supposed to be experiencing things and having 
having things test us to challenge us to grow. We're supposed to be continuing to grow intentionally with whatever we want to be. Um, maybe that's running, maybe that's accounting. If that's accounting, you're definitely not my people either. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a numbers person. Um, but, but yeah, that's so true. I mean, and identifying those things is to the core, like how you start working through any doubts or fears that we do carry with us um, because we do all the time but yeah. if we're not aware of them and what where they're coming from and why then I mean you can never really get rid of them so I love that um so we talked about how you know you've got a handle on how to move through fears like these and um, I love dreaming and hearing what people have to say. So now that you are living fearlessly, where do you see yourself five years from today? Oh, that's easy because I've just been working on this. Like I've, I've really been, been visioning it. Um, I, I really see myself moving out of individual health coaching, um, which I do still really enjoy because I think particularly I work a lot, you know, with women 40 to 55, um, and there's not a lot of people working in that space. Um, but I kind of have occupational ADD, so I don't see myself still doing it in five years. That would put me in almost 10 years, and that's like way too long for me. Um, I, I really want to keep moving in the direction of doing um, more speaking at women's events, running my own retreats, um, and offering places where women can come and talk about things that aren't talked about, whether that's from the health coaching side of like, what the heck's going on in my body? Um, or just, you know, I can't remember anything anymore. Why am I feeling this way? I hate my family now, you know, oh, what? There's a biological component to that, you know, useful. Um, <laughs> so uh, do, doing more of the speaking, the facilitating um, and really holding space for women so that um, as they grow and move through seasons of life that they don't feel left behind. Um, I think one of the most exciting, truly exciting things about um, 45 um, being a truly middle-aged woman, and I don't say that with any kind of negative baggage at all, um, is that I'm in the first generation of women who at 45 have 45 good years really possibly 45 more good years ahead of me. And that is freaking amazing. I mean, when you think two, three generations ago, by the time women were 45, they were, you know, grandparents and slowing down. And that's so not on my radar. And so I think, you know, continuing to, to have this plan of, of speaking out and saying, you know, there's a real second act to life. Um, I have an eight year old, so let's also not pretend that I'm going to be like, you know, an empty nester in a year. Um, I got kids at home for a while yet. Um, but, it, but it's fascinating. And I think that it's really interesting to see how, um, you know, women who are like 30 to 45 right now are, are really handling this huge societal change. Because, you know, I, uh, when my mom was 45, I am her last, her last child. Um, I was a freshman in college and I have a third grader. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's little, different. A little different. A little different. Um, you know, and I think that, that there is, a, that as a society, that shift has happened. Um, and so to continue to give voice to women, you know, it's not just, just as we age that, that we have wisdom, but that, you know, there's a lot it's of opportunity. Experience. It's, it's experience that we, that we move through that now. It's not just age. It's not just everyone has that when they age. It's now it's what you do, like going to do that race. You have so much experience because you had that in itself. That life experience was just everything. Planning it out, training, the money that you put up for it, taking your whole family, like yeah. all of those things. You're, yeah, it's, it's yeah. definitely encompassing all of that in, in the one thing. Um, yeah. Where is the best place for the viewers to connect with you? 
Uh, my website is wellbalancedwomen.com and on Well Balanced Women, you can find uh, my blog, which is really in depth for women's health coaching, um, health education, um, very fitness oriented, um, and then also links to how to find me on my other social media. Perfect. So go, go check out um, her website to, to connect with her. And um, Karen, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come talk more with us about your story and, and hear about the experiences that you have had. This was so great to, to get to know more in depth about you and your family and, and all of that. That was great. Well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Yeah. Is there, what is one last thing that you would want to leave the viewers with um, in general about fear? Take a breath and take a step. Ooh, I like it. Simple. Yep. But sometimes hard. <laughs> but sometimes really, really hard. Yeah. 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 Take a breath and take a step. Take a breath and take a step. I love it. Thank you for that. Everyone that's watching, thank you for joining us. Uh, great in the comments, any questions you have. And remember to love yourself and live fearlessly. Thanks for tuning in.